So good morning, welcome, and thank you for participating in the sixth of our leader talk series. Focusing in on our community's continuing battle with COVID-19. My name is Keith Seib. I'm director for business and industry services at Catawba Valley Community College. Working in collaboration with K64 and the Chamber of Catawba County, our goal in the previous leader talks has been to provide business leaders throughout our community information to help them face the challenges brought on by the coronavirus. If you would like to review our previous leader talks, simply go to CVCC's webpage or to the K K64 webpage and review those. With our leader talk today and with the following leader talk on August the 11th, we're shifting gears a little bit to focus on education and how we as a community can open our schools safely. Our leader talk today focuses in on higher education and the steps that our local colleges and university are, open, are taking to open safely. Dr. Keith Mackey, Executive Vice President here at CVCC, will introduce today's leader talks and our three distinguished speakers. Following Dr. Mackey, each of our guest speakers will share the steps their schools are taking to reopen safely, as well as their thoughts on the impacts of COVID-19 on education in general and how we move forward in this new normal. Then Jennifer Jones, business liaison with K64, will open the floor up for Q&A. Thank you to those of you that submitted questions in advance, or you can use the Q&A chat function in the WebEx to submit any questions that you have for us today. Following the Q&A session, Dean Bryce Milton will introduce a new webinar series called Education Talks, focusing in on educational issues in the new normal working under COVID-19. In closing, Cindy Fulbright, Program Manager for CVCC's Furniture Academy, will share our focus for our next leader talk scheduled for August the 11th. With that, Dr. Mackey, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Keith, and good morning. We're so pleased that you're able to join us this morning. On behalf of the faculty and staff of Catawba Valley Community College, I welcome you and wish you and your family our very best. We appreciate everything that you're doing to keep our community safe and strong as we move forward. It seems that new questions are coming up about COVID every day, and the questions are often ones we've not had to deal with before. So not surprisingly, there's a great deal of discussion currently around current and future plans for education. So today our experts will be discussing the safe opening of our region's higher education institutions. And we will also learn about the unique challenges that have faced and continue to face higher education due to COVID. We're fortunate to have three outstanding speakers today, Dr. Garrett Henshaw, Dr. Fred Witt, and Dr. Mark Porch. They are three not only extraordinary higher education leaders, but also community leaders as well. So first, I'd just like to thank you gentlemen for being with us today and spending time with us and talking about this very important issue. And our first speaker today is Dr. Garrett Henshaw. Dr. Henshaw is the third president of Catawba Valley Community College. Dr. Henshaw holds a doctoral degree from NC State University and a master's and bachelor degrees from Appalachian State University. Dr. Henshaw has led the college since 2006 and has grown the college through innovative and community building partnerships. Dr. Henshaw led the development of the 28,000 square foot CVCC Valley Sim Hospital. He restructured and expanded the Manufacturing Solutions Center and led the transition of the center to a research and development operation, including a business incubator. He also opened the state-of-the-art 86,000 square foot workforce solutions complex focused on future talent development. Since 2006, under Dr. Henshaw's leadership, CVCC also established the Catawba Valley Furniture Academy, the Alexander Furniture Academy, the Manufacturing Academy, Construction Academy, and Coding Academy to meet the direct workforce needs of our region. Following a strong belief in providing access to higher education for all, Dr. Henshaw has increased diversity on our campus through the college's Office of Multicultural Affairs and through the college's programming made available to all high school students in Alexander and Catawba counties. Dr. Henshaw has received a number of accolades and awards, including inaugural Catawba County Leadership Award 
He also serves the community as a member of a number of boards and organizations aimed at bettering the lives of our citizens. Dr. Henshaw, thank uh, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Mackey, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's such an honor to be able to talk with you. On March 16th of 2020, our world's changed. Um, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic became a United States issue and, and really changed the way that we were thinking, changed the way that we were operating. Within two weeks, we had to convert every one of our services and our programs of study to an online format. Now, our students didn't choose that. Our faculty did not choose that. It was one of those things that we, we just had to do in order to, to move through this. There was no training, no um, classes that I've ever taken in my history that prepared me to answer the questions that were being asked about what's next. Every day was a new day. It seemed as though I was breathing through a straw during that time period, just trying to figure out what's our next step, what's our best next step. I was inspired by our students, by our faculty, by our staff, just how they stepped up to the plate and answered the call. We finished the spring semester for all of our programs and our students graduated uh, this past Saturday in a drive-through ceremony. Again, not a choice we would make nor what our students wanted, but it's necessary in today's situation. We are looking at a fall reopening where we will offer blended instruction. We will have some students that are on campuses that do a hands-on education for healthcare, for uh, workforce credentialing and that sort of thing. But the majority of what we do will remain virtual. I've encouraged our employees to telework from home to continue to do that where, where at all possible, but we will be open and we'll be open safely. We have invested a great deal of resources in assuring that we could create an environment that was the safest that we possibly could create for our students to continue their learning and our faculty and staff continue to pursue their passion to help individuals move forward. We will have strict protocols in place. Students, faculty, staff, community visitors will be required to wear face coverings. We will scan, thermo scan temperatures on entry into each building. Entry into each building will be restricted to one portal. And so we're gonna be watching this every day. We're gonna to continue to encourage social distancing encourage hand washing, but we're gonna to have to monitor each individual that, that moves through our campus as we try to continue to move through with some level of normalcy. But we will not sacrifice quality. That's the big issue that I've said from day one. We figure out a plan, we execute the plan, and then we go day to day evaluating how that plan is working and how our students are progressing in this new environment. I think, you know, this is, our new norm for a while. Uh, even if a vaccine is approved by the 1st of 2021, it's gonna take considerable time for that vaccine to be distributed broadly throughout the United States and the world. So we are looking at real innovative ways to continue to improve the way that we communicate with our students, the way that we communicate with the community and our employees. Um, but what we have learned is we can do this and that we can we can do things remotely that we didn't think were possible in the past. And it, so it's changing the way we work. It's changing the way we think, but it doesn't change our commitment to excellence. Our faculty and staff uh, have really stepped up to the plate in terms of their development in, in relation to technology and how to use new tools to connect with our students, engage with our students and demonstrate the value. Tower Valley Community College is going to be here and we're going to be open and we're going to be open as safely as we possibly can. There are a lot of what ifs and there are a lot of not right answers or no answers, but together we can do this. And if everyone will collaborate and adhere to the, the ideas that, and, and protocols that we put into place, we believe that we can move through this pandemic and not let it define us but rather us define ourselves and our futures by working together in, in very different ways, but closer and, and more collaboratively. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. 
Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Fred Witt. Dr. Witt is Lenore Ryan University's 12th president. Dr. Witt earned his doctorate from the University of Tennessee and his Master of Arts and Bachelor of Science from Appalachian State University. Dr. Witt began, began his tenure at Lenore Ryan in 2017 with over 30 years of successful leadership experience in higher education at both private and public universities. Previously, Dr. Witt served as the founding dean of the Beaver College of Health Sciences at his alma mater, Appalachian State University. He was serving as dean when he was appointed to lead the development of the first new college at Appalachian State in over 40 years. In Dr. Witt's first three years at Lenore Ryan, enrollment has seen record growth and two capital projects have been completely and fully funded by private donations. Lenore Ryan is in the first year of a five-year strategic plan entitled Pivoting to a New Level of Excellence. The plan involves all three campuses <coughs> as well as faculty, staff, and students and will shape the future of Lenore Ryan University. Dr. Witt and his wife Donna have been married for 42 years and are the proud parents of two adult married sons. Welcome, Dr. Witt. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Keith, and I appreciate it. And uh, uh, thank you for hosting and uh, such an important topic. And I appreciate being a part of this shared collaborative effort, you know, with our broader community um, to certainly meet the higher education needs throughout not only Catawba County, but our, our uniform region. As Keith mentioned, I've been in higher education actually now over 40 years. And managing COVID-19, I can tell you, is as challenging of an issue that I faced in my lifetime, and one that certainly has tested our ability to be able to adapt, to be flexible, uh, and to remain flexible in search, such unprecedented times of, of uncertainty. The one message I told our faculty, staff, and students that has been very consistent is we're consistently uncertain as to uh, how we're going to manage this. Uh, but we've pulled together, I think, a, a, a pretty outstanding plan that, that we think we can implement well. You know, when we begin this journey in March, and is like Dr. Henshaw indicated, we converted eight to 900 classes online and finished out the semester very positively. Uh, which is a challenge, particularly in some of our clinical programs. But, you know, we made decisions back there on, uh, in March and uh, early April. We would make decisions one morning at 10 o'clock that by 3 o'clock that same afternoon were already outdated and needed to be revised because things were moving so swiftly. People use the term, it's, it's a fluid situation, and it's, to me it's like whitewater fluid situation is what we're dealing with. Um, we're three weeks from the beginning of our classes from uh, three weeks from yesterday, and uh, we have a plan in place and I'd like to walk through that a little bit and then we'll be uh, taking questions a little bit later. But back in March, right before this hit, we had appointed a presidential task force of over 20 individuals on the campus and then around the community to look at campus disruption in, in general. We've had some power outages. We've had some storms come through. And we're two days without power. Uh, sometimes you have some uh, unanticipated bad weather. And with technology, how do we continue to operate? Well, that task force quickly became the, the COVID-19 task force, and they began to work in subgroups to make plans for a safe return uh, to campus this fall. And this group has been outstanding. They've been meeting every week uh, for five months now. And in their subgroups have been, have met more than that. Have come back with some really good uh, recommendations and policies as we move forward. The, the kind of four, five, six major areas where we're looking at the academic calendar and, and the course delivery. Uh, so we've had a team look at that. Uh, we've announced that we will begin on time, uh, August the 24th, but we'll end classes this fall a little earlier, the Friday before Thanksgiving. And, and, and not have a fall break. And we're doing that to kind of discourage students from going away and then bringing uh, things back. So without having a fall break, with being finished with on-campus activities before Thanksgiving, it kind of um, mitigates that issue. And then we will have exams uh, at the end of, uh, after Thanksgiving that will be remote. Our class delivery will be somewhat different. Uh, from a pedagogical standpoint, 
we're going to try to use a modified flipped classroom approach. If you aren't as familiar with that, but uh, what that typically means is the things you do uh, inside class will now be outside class and the things that you do outside of class will be inside. So the lectures or the content will be delivered online. Um, the uh, classes when they meet will be more engaged, which is a, a good thing to do regardless of COVID. Uh, our classes typically meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday. So classes will continue to meet Tuesday, Thursday, but in order to practice social distancing, half the class would meet on Monday, the other, or Tuesday, the other half on Thursday, and the same way with Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but it'll be Monday, Friday, and then that'll leave Wednesday as an opportunity to have an academic day where you're doing additional labs and clinical rotations. So it is a hybrid model where it's not totally online, but they'll be face-to-face, -face and uh, we think it'll be a, a good model for us to follow. The second sort of area is in around infection prevention and control. And, you know, COVID is here. It's it's how we how we manage it. And so we're, again, focusing on the three Ws, you know, wearing a face covering, uh, waiting, and making sure you distance for six feet, and then certainly washing your hands frequently in the appropriate way. Uh, we've updated our cleaning and our disinfecting. A typical classroom, for example, may only have 12 students as opposed to 24. They'll be six feet apart. There'll be hand sanitizing stations in each classroom. There'll be disinfectant wipes so that there'll be extra time in between classes so students can come in, wipe down their desk area within about 50 seconds. It's, it's totally uh, 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 been disinfected. So uh, we feel like what the classroom situation will be is safer than about anywhere you could go in and around the community. Uh, we're going to be monitoring the health of the students, so the whole health monitoring. Temperature checks, as Dr. Henshaw mentioned, we're going to be purchasing apps for students known as Live Safe, Work Safe, that will allow them to uh, monitor their symptoms and record those so that we're coming into a, a dining hall area that will hold up their their cell phone and if it's a green light, you know, they're good to go. It also helps us with some contact tracing if there is an illness outbreak uh, later on. Uh, so that's been very important for us to do. We're not making those decisions in, in the infection and uh, prevention and control just, just on what we think. We've had a great partnership with our health departments here in Catawba County, the North Carolina Health Department here in Catawba County. Jennifer McCracken's been great. We have outstanding uh, uh, infectious disease doctors that are located here in Catawba County, even though they serve the entire region. Some of our alums happen to be infectious disease doctors. We've been in contact with the uh, CDC. So everything we're doing and revising and monitoring uh, is being uh, guided by the science and by the health experts. Um, and then so the health monitoring thing is a way that uh, we can we can help uh, uh, control the situation. Certainly being a Division II NCA athletic program creates some challenges. And so we're having to manage that through NCA regulations at our own conference. And right now we're planning to play athletics this fall, but we'll delay those any competition until September the 26th. And we'll only play fall sports within our own uh, South Atlantic Conference region. Uh, that'll allow us to have consistent testing uh, between all programs uh, and to be able to reduce the travel in that regard. And that's continuing to be monitored. The NCA will meet today. They may change uh, playoffs and championships and move to spring. And so we may have to pivot if that's the uh, case. But right now, as of today, at 11.50 uh, uh, a.m., we're, we're going to be playing athletics this fall. And last but certainly not least is around the whole campus residential life, housing, dining activities. Um, we're certainly trying to upgrade and integrate technology, not just in the curriculum, but managing our health. So we want the students to have as normal of experience possible and get that campus life experience, but yet do it in the right way. So students will still have roommates. We've been advised by the health experts uh, that will treat roommates or suite mates as a family, but things will be a little different. They won't be able to have visitation or go into other, uh, have students from another residence hall into their residence hall. 
uh, there'll be some enhanced cleaning. There's we contract out with Aramark for our uh, maintenance on the campus, as well as our dining, a national company, and they'll be using certain chemicals and spraying down showers and baths that that, that kill the uh, virus pretty much on contact. So uh, uh, I think we've got some great measures in place in our residential life and dining area. Uh, so it's a different, if it's different environment, we are going to be testing. We've had a chance this summer to be able to pilot some of our protocols. We've had about 60 to 80 student athletes here on campus the last four weeks. We've been testing them. Uh, we've also been able to, to see how it, it works with roommates and the dining hall if, if we have to quarantine. And so it's been a, a good sort of pilot test to see if we can do this. Uh, but we're not going to be driven by the politics. We aren't going to be driven by the economics or, or the fact that our students definitely want to come back. We want to we want to be driven by what's in the best interest of the health, safety, and well-being of all of our all of our students, faculty, and staff. And so we're monitoring that every day, and that could change. Uh, but we're okay with that. Um, the one thing I do want to say in closing is that being a part of this community. And the fact that we're working together as a partnership and that we're resilient and that we're collaborative, whether it's here in Catawba County, through the health department, through the community colleges, through the chamber, the city and county, we've been attacking this for the last four months uh, as a team. And to have our colleagues from Caldwell County today, we're looking at this as an entire uniform area. And that has made it so much easier to address these issues. So I thank my, I'm very blessed to be a part of the community and I, I wouldn't be any place other than the Lenore Iron University in Hickory, North Carolina here in Catawba County, because we can do this collaboratively and we can make it better. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Witt. We appreciate that. Thank you for sharing the information. You've got a lot of things going on. We appreciate your work to keep the community safe as we go forward. Our third speaker is Dr. Mark Porch. Dr. Porch was named as the fourth president of Caldwell Community College in July 2016. This mm -hmm. follows uh, a diverse background in higher education and 28 years of community college experience. Dr. Porch earned his Doctor of Education and Education Specialist degrees at Appalachian State University and his master's degree in education and bachelor's degree in business administration at Western Carolina University. Go Catamounts. His 10 years at Caldwell Community College prior to being named president includes a diverse background, including serving as Associate Vice President of Student Services, Vice President of Student Services, and Executive Vice President. As Executive Vice President, Dr. Port served as the Chief Operating and Academic Officer for the institution, managing all internal operations of the multi-campus institution, including the strategic plan, instructional programming, student services, information technology, facilities, institutional effectiveness, grant activities, budget, enrollment trends in the accreditation process. Dr. Mark Porch and his wife, Tracy, reside in Hudson and have three children, Dylan, Bailey, and Carly. Dr. Porch, we appreciate you spending time with us this morning. Thank you, sir, and, and good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for letting the guy from across the river join you. Um, one of the things I'm not, I don't think uh, Dr. Mackey mentioned, but I, I did start my community college career at Catawba Valley Community College and spent 14 great years there. So it's, it's a delight uh, to join my colleagues from Catawba County uh, this morning. So thank, thanks for having me. Um, as Dr. Henshaw mentioned, uh, March kind of uh, threw us for a loop and uh, he talked about the many challenges from spring semester. And uh, I'd like to start there before I kind of talk about our plan for uh, the upcoming fall semester. But we certainly, uh, as an institution and, and probably as a higher educational system, many of us were not ready for what happened to us in March. Uh, we did have to make the transition to online learning in, in just a short amount of time. Many of our students weren't ready and many of our faculty uh, were not ready. In fact, for us at Caldwell, we had a 21% increase in the number of withdrawals uh, for spring semester. So many of our students just could not do the online learning environment. Uh, many of those students had technology challenges. 
Uh, many of them just had um, life challenges, uh, dealing with daycare, trying to be homeschool parents at the same time they were trying to be uh, college students. Many of them lost their jobs. Many of them had financial hardships. Uh, so our students had tremendous challenges in the spring. Our faculty had tremendous challenges in the spring. Uh, we asked faculty to teach in an online environment and many of them had never done that. Uh, so we, in spite of our uh, best efforts, in spite of all the professional development that we provided for both employees and for students, uh, it was just not an ideal uh, situation. And we've heard from students and we've heard from our employees. Many of our students want to be back on campus. They want that face-to-face -face interaction. And many of our faculty and staff, uh, you know, are, are anxious to get students back on campus. They miss having the students here. They miss the college atmosphere. And so we are, <clears throat> we are uh, looking forward to our semester starting uh, in less than two weeks, we start on Monday, the 17th of August uh, for students. Our employees, most of them will come back next Monday on, on August the 10th. And um, uh, one of the uh, biggest changes for us as we as we look to fall semester, <clears throat> excuse me, is our course delivery. Uh, the majority of our classes will be offered in a hybrid format. Dr. Witt spoke, spoke to this uh, and what they're doing at LR. Uh, but many of our classes will be part online and part in person. Uh, that will reduce greatly the amount of time students are on our campus face to face. Uh, but that, to me, that's kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, students can have that interaction with their peers. They can have that interaction uh, with the faculty, uh, but on a limited basis. We do still have some completely seated classes that are being offered. Uh, we have about 70. Uh, classes that are lab based. Uh, Dr. Henshaw mentioned health sciences and some of the other areas that just can't be offered effectively in an online environment. Uh, we too have many technical types uh, of classes that will be offered face to face. And again, that number is 70. Just to give you a, an idea of how that compares, that number was over 330 last fall. So a great reduction in the number of strictly face to face classes uh, that will be uh, on our campus. Students will see certainly a different world when they come on campus on the on the 24th. We have many of the same safety protocols in place as Catawba Valley and as Lenore Ryan. Uh, face coverings will be required in all of our buildings. Uh, we have distanced our classrooms and lab spaces, so all of the desks and tables are at least six feet apart. Uh, one of the challenges with that is that has greatly reduced the number of students that we can serve in each section. So a faculty member who maybe was teaching 30 students in a class may now only have 15 students in a class, which means from a physical standpoint, you know, we're having to hire more faculty. It's costing us more money to, to teach the same number of students uh, in essence. Um, <clears throat> we are also gonna require temperature scans each day as people enter our buildings. We purchase scanners to help us do that. Um, also, one of the unique things about community colleges and Catawba Valley has this on their campus and, and we have two innovative high schools on our campus. So we have over 600 high schoolers who come here to take their high school classes as well as their community college classes. So what we're trying to do with our safety protocols is mirror as best we can uh, those protocols that take, take place on the public school side. Uh, so our public school partners, they're going to be doing their own temperature checks uh, for their students as they exit their vehicle or as they exit their buses. <clears throat> and all of our students, employees, whether they're uh, community college students or high school students will all be issued wristbands, colored wristbands for the day, indicating that they have uh, a temperature that's acceptable. And, uh, and, and as they're out and about on campus, we'll know that they've been screened successfully uh, for the day. We also have uh, hired several additional housekeeping housekeeping staff and uh, put in place additional cleaning uh, and disinfecting protocols that will happen throughout the day. We bought uh, various cleaning machines so we can go in and, and essentially fog classrooms and lab spaces to reduce the, uh, the spread uh, of the virus. Of course, we've installed plexiglass barriers in, in many of our reception areas. Uh, we've purchased uh, social distancing furniture for our library spaces and, and our more common areas. 
and in many of our public uh, areas uh, that typically would have large gatherings, those areas are being uh, closed off for the fall semester. So things like our, our weight room, our student lounge areas, uh, things of that nature will remain closed. Uh, we are going to allow food trucks on campus uh, this fall and just try to manage uh, that through social distancing. Uh, however, we're closing off things like water fountains, except for those fountains that have bottle filling stations and, and those kinds of things. Th those are some of the um, some of the highlights that I would say that we have implemented uh, for fall semester. Obviously, all of our goals is to bring students back safely while we continue to deliver uh, quality educational programs and we fulfill the mission of our institutions. You know, the one thing that uh, that I would like to say that uh, was even more apparent this spring than it ever has been, and that is partnerships matter. And the things that you're doing in Catawba County that Dr. Whit and Dr. Henshaw spoke about, that's so critical to the success of your educational institutions, to your business and industry partners. And uh, we're fortunate as well in, in Caldwell and Watauga counties, the two areas that we serve, that we have those same kind of relationships. We partnered with Google uh, this spring to uh, deal with some of the technology challenges that our students were having. They donated 75 Chromebooks uh, and we were able to get those in the hands of students pretty quickly so they could uh, do their online classes. Uh, Google also uh, rolled out hotspots on, on school buses and stationed those in the more rural areas of our community so students could have access to Wi-Fi. Uh, we increased our uh, bandwidth and our Wi-Fi capabilities so students could access uh, our internet services in our, in our parking lots. And then another unique thing that we partnered with Google on was uh, this summer we have installed video conferencing classrooms in each of our traditional high schools. Uh, so if, if hopefully they'll end up being in, in classes in person in, in our high schools and we can deliver college classes from the community college to each of those public schools and uh, eliminate the need for those students to come on onto our campus. Uh, again, trying to mitigate the, the spread of, of COVID-19. Uh, one of the other uh, partnerships that we're very proud of that I think it's going to be extremely valuable as we open back up, uh, and this is a little bit unique for community college, and we have a, a health clinic on our campus. It's called the Cobra Care Clinic, where we partner with West Caldwell Health Council, and they provide full medical services on site to our students and to our employees. And they are going to have the rapid test um, for the virus. So uh, we, we're hoping that that partnership can help us uh, again manage and mitigate uh, the spread of, of COVID-19, but that's a tremendous partnership and has proven to be um, you know, just greatly successful and, and a great resource for our, our students and, and our employees. Um, we, we're gonna have some challenges. All of us are gonna have some challenges. And again, I think the, the word uh, since March that I've used with our faculty and staff is flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. We don't know what's coming tomorrow and we are having to make decisions um, without really having a, a crystal ball. I think as Dr. Henshaw said, there's no playbook for this. There's no uh, textbook that tells you what to do. So we're trying to work together and um, and with, our, with our, all of our community partners to make the educational experience better for our students and for our employees. And again, to continue to deliver quality educational programs and meet the needs of our region. So thank you for, for having me. Uh, I look forward to working with both of these gentlemen as we go forward in the, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you so much, Dr. Porch, Dr. Witt, and Dr. Henshaw. We appreciate each of you sharing your time and uh, that valuable information with us today. And as each of you mentioned, collaboration is critical and we appreciate you guys being with us today. Thanks to all those who are in attendance. I did want to mention that today's webinar has been recorded and will be posted to CVCC and K64 websites as well as the websites of our partners here um, today, after today's event. We do have some questions that have come in that I wanted to, um, to ask you guys to share answers for. Um, the first one is uh, for Dr. Witt, what is the application called that can track symptoms or if anybody else knows the answer to that? Could you repeat the question? Sure, what is the application? Yeah. Okay, yes, yes. 
it is, you can look it up. It's live safe, work safe. Uh, it's pretty comprehensive. We're going to provide that. We're going to pay for that. Uh, some universities have moved away from Rave Alert and have used this more comprehensively. Uh, we're going to continue to do both and see, you know, we'll have the Rave Alert for storms, weather, those sort of things. This app, in addition to uh, 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 the, uh, the, the work safe, monitor your symptoms. The live safe would allow a student, let's say they wanted to leave their residence and uh, go to go to Wendy's somewhere at uh, 2 a.m. because they were hungry. They can let someone know and they, they can be tracked. Uh, only those who only the people that they would want them to trace in case they had a flat tire or an unfortunate accident, uh, they would know where they were. And so uh, we think it's going to be good for the campus, whether it's COVID related or not. But uh, Thank you, Dr. Witt. Another question, when you get the inevitable positives, will you still be able to keep going or what's the plan? Is there a tipping point that would change the plan? Does anybody want to speak to that one? Jack, I, I think we're going to uh, look at this on a case by case basis. I mean, I know that we've got some tentative ideas about what we would do if it was one person who uh, tested positive and had been in our learning environment. Uh, we have other scenarios where it's multiple people, depending on what areas they access on our campus and sort of what their schedules would be. Maybe we, we would just isolate a particular group of people for a period of time, but it wouldn't be held against these students. We're, we're going to have to work with our students just like we did in the spring. Um, we've got to be creative and we've got to be understanding of the situation that we're facing. Uh, one scenario that we have discussed in detail is what happens if we have a department unit of our employees who uh, all of a sudden are exposed and test positive. Well, fortunately, due to our experience this spring, uh, we can revert back to online for that department on teleworking. So I think it's going to be a case by case, a tipping points if we had broad spread all of a sudden COVID positive tests that were scattered around the campus. I think at that point in time, you consider a shutdown like we did in the spring for a couple of weeks, do the deep cleaning, and then pick it back up when, when it's safe. So uh, we're going to have to monitor this every day. Uh, it's going to change every day. We've got to, we're creating ways for people to let us know if they have tested positive or been exposed uh, to the virus. So uh, it's just a new, it's a new order and a new way of, of doing things. But the key to this whole thing is for all of us to communicate better than we've ever communicated with our students, with our employees, check on people, make sure that we're doing the right things. And again, if everyone will follow the protocols that are in place at all three institutions, I think we can get through this successfully. Um, but that's yet to be seen and, and we'll go each day as and take it one step at a time. And I'll, I'll just add to that. I think, you know, following the protocols is going to be key. We're, we're hopeful that um, if people were wearing their mask and they're socially distanced, then if, uh, if we do have a positive case, then that will <clears throat> not mean that we have to shut down the entire class, for example, that we can isolate that student and then everybody else can just kind of self monitor. That's the advice we've been given by our health director. And so we're just trying to make sure that everybody follows the protocols. Uh, we did have a situation this spring. Uh, where we had a couple of employees in the same area uh, test positive. And uh, so we had to isolate, if you will, uh, and ask uh, folks in that department to stay home because at that time we were not requiring masks and we were not socially distancing. So it, it, uh, we had about 25 employees at the same time at home uh, teleworking from those areas. So it can have a significant impact on your operations if you have positive cases. And uh, again, I think that's the reason it's so important and, and communication, uh, Dr. Henshaw, is the key. Uh, you know, trying to make sure our students understand why we're asking them to, to do these things and trying to make sure our employees understand why we're asking uh, them to wear masks and do temperature scans and all of those things. None of us like it. Uh, I don't know anybody that likes wearing a mask all day long and that kind of thing, but uh, unfortunately, I think it's a necessary evil to help us get through this. I would just add that uh, I think Gary hit the nail on the head. There's not just one tipping point. It depends on the situation, the severity, whether they're symptom asymptomatic, 
Uh, I would say this, it's not going to be if somebody tests positive, it's going to be when they test positive because uh, there's no doubt there'll be COVID. I mean, uh, uh, one of the things we are implementing is a, is a testing routine for our faculty, staff and students. We've piloted that this summer. So uh, and being residential, it makes it a little more challenging, but we've, we've created some spaces with single rooms, single uh, bathrooms, private bathrooms, and so that we can quarantine. Uh, we think that students, if they uh, do test positive, whether they have symptoms or not, need, need to go home if they can. But if you live in Oregon or you live in Germany, uh, that's that's not an issue. Uh, that's an issue. And then we have some students who don't have a home or a safe home to go to, just as has happened in the spring. And we would continue to have those students as, as best we can. So, um, so uh, I don't think there's one particular tipping point. It depends on... Uh, a variety of factors and we would rely on our, our local health department experts to help guide us through that. Thank you all so much. So kind of building on that, um, what happens if uh, a student's asking, what happens if one of my class, or excuse me, what happens if my instructor gets COVID-19? Uh, will the class be suspended or will there be a substitute instructor? What's the plan in that situation? Well, in our case, we would treat it like if a instructor had any kind of illness. What happens is the instructor uh, is in an automobile accident out for a week or if, uh, if they have a, a, a gastrointestinal, uh, gastrointestinal uh, infection. Uh, we may have someone take the class or in a case uh, like we had this summer where someone may be tested asymptomatic, they're quarantined, but they are able to deliver their courses online during that time. So, so hopefully nothing would change. Perfect. Very good. All right. Um, question about tuition for online versus seated classes. Will there be a, a, a differentiation there? I guess I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> Mark answered it really well. Um, at, at Lenore Ryan, our, our, we don't have fees. We just have tuition or room and board. So, uh, if like we did in the spring where students had to leave campus, we refunded 100% of the two, excuse me, of the room and board that they did not get, which was about $1.7 million. Uh, so we, we don't, didn't have to do that, it's the right thing to do. As for tuition, it actually costs more to deliver courses online and in virtual formats uh, than it does face to face because you have to hire more instructors, you have more technology involved. And at many universities, the cost for credit hour for online is higher than it is for face to face. So there would, wouldn't be the course delivery a change in tuition. But I would remind folks out there that are in if uh, we offer uh, uh, very attractive uh, tuition discounts in terms of scholarships, if a person from from the, anywhere in North Carolina now, I had started just in Catawba County with a partnership to K64. Has a 3.5 GPA and is from this area, they'll get half off tuition here at Lenore Island regardless. Yeah, and Fred, we really appreciate that partnership too because uh, through our graduation this past Saturday, it was amazing to me how many of our students are now going to Lenore Island when that wasn't necessarily an option for our students in the past. Our, our tuition will remain the same. Uh, we don't keep our tuition in a North Carolina community college system. It goes directly back to the state's general fund. So, uh, but it is gonna cost more for us to, to do what we do. So that's something that we're having conversations with our legislators uh, talking about. It could be up to three times what it traditionally cost us to offer a semester and, to, and serve the number of students that we traditionally serve. Uh, so it's gonna be, uh, everything's a challenge, everything's a change, but uh, you know, we're up for it. But our focus is always gonna be on, on what's the, on the best interest of those students. And if we can't offer a class or a program at the same quality that we have come to expect here historically, we're just not gonna offer it. And you know, that's something that we're evaluating on a class by class basis, depending on the format that it's, that it's put forth, but the, the cost structure will not change for us. And the only thing I'll add to that, of course, Dr. Henshaw addressed the, the General Assembly sets our tuition rate. 
So we don't have a, um, uh, a choice in that matter per se, but um, we're, we're glad to let everybody know that that tuition rate is going to stay the same for next year uh, for community colleges across the state of North Carolina at $76 a credit hour uh, for in-state students. Uh, at Caldwell, we do have uh, a few uh, fees that are imposed by the institution. Uh, the primary one is a student activity fee where we support our student government association. We support student athletics and other activities on campus. Uh, those fees are going to remain uh, for this year, and we're looking for innovative and creative ways to engage our students uh, virtually uh, or if they're on campus to provide activities for them. You know, we, we think that's important. Our students want to connect. They need to connect. And whether that's virtually or in person, we're going to look for ways to do that, keep them engaged, and we know that will help them be successful. Thank you very much. We have a, a question, I think, um, maybe goes back to Dr. Witt. What if a student refuses or declines to use the app for COVID tracking? That becomes a student conduct code issue. What if a student lights up a cigarette in the classroom? What if, a, you know, so uh, there are all sort of student conduct issues. But one of the things we do here, students that, that come in as freshmen sign, a, sign an honor code. And we make a big deal out of that. This fall, we're going to add a pledge, a COVID-19 pledge. All our students and faculty and staff will sign. And it really outlines some education about COVID uh, and what a responsible citizen would do, uh, whether it's use the app, whether it's, you know, we're not, they don't have to use the app for tracking. That's up to them. But uh, uh, to, to monitor their health, it'll really make it much easier for them to do that and someone else do that for them. Uh, so I think once they get into it, they'll find it's uh, kind of fun to use and they'll be able to, to do some other things. But it, it, I've been asked the same question, what happens if a student won't wear a mask? Well, they they won't be in the class and the, or they won't be on campus. There'll be consequences. But hopefully we'll all work together. Our students are dying to come back. It's, it's almost like three to one. They want to be here. And uh, I think they're willing to do what they need to do to make that happen. Uh, you know, they've mentioned, uh, Mark was talking about making it as realistic as possible. I met with our music faculty. We have a strong music program, the marching band, the acapella choir, the wind ensemble. Those are gonna continue and they have found ways. There's research that's been done on whether you use plexiglass in those situations. We're going to rent tents and play outside. There are ways to be able to continue to do things as, as normal as possible uh, uh, to be able to still engage in the activities, whether it's athletics, whether it's theater, whether it's music, whether it's Student Government Association. And we want to continue to, to, to have that campus experience, even though it be somewhat different in as creative ways as possible. Thank you, Dr. Witt. Um, so, Dr. Witt talked a little bit about athletics at Lenore Run. There's um, uh, another question for that is, uh, do you have a plan for spectators and tailgate gatherings, Dr. Witt? And then if Dr. Porch and Dr. Henshaw, you might speak for a minute to what's going on with athletics at the community college level. We're working on it. <laughs> the first thing we wanted to do is see if we can play and to see if we can participate. And the if we can, then the next level will be uh, how do we manage uh, the crowd, uh, tailgating, et cetera? You know, we're going to follow the mandates of our governor. And right now we're in a, a limit as to how many can gather outdoors or indoors. And while higher education is somewhat exempted from that, we still want to be able to socially distance. And I know Governor Cooper will be addressing uh, uh, the state here shortly in the next few days. And depending on which phase we're in, we'll adjust to that. The plans are being made. Uh, final plans have not been made. Uh, our first home game would not be until September the 26th for football. So we've got a little time to uh, to make those plans. We're, we're testing all of our student athletes as they come back onto campus on a regular basis. And as Dr. Witt said, we're just we want to play. We know the student athletes want to play and. Uh, we probably have 132 student athletes who will be coming in this fall with expectations to continue their athletic career while they're earning a credential or a degree. And um, one of the things that we're looking at is, is how do we 
uh, virtually deliver the experience for their parents, for uh, Red Hawk Nation fans. Uh, that could be one option that we look at, as Dr. Witt said, depending on what the governor does on gatherings going forward and what type of situation our community is in here. Um, but we are looking at all those things and uh, we'll definitely be, if, if we are allowed to play by the National Junior College Athletic Association uh, this fall, we'll be, we'll be moving forward. They are moving all of our championships to the spring uh, for sure. And so uh, we'll continue to, to monitor that and, and work with our national association on uh, providing quality athletic opportunities. Yeah, we uh, same as Dr. Henshaw, our, our student athletes want to play. Um, you know, we we launched uh, baseball and soft, men's baseball, women's softball last spring, and those seasons were cut short. And and so for our student athletes, that was extremely disappointing in our inaugural season for both of those sports. Some of those student athletes are back, and we just hope that they have the opportunity to to get on the field and compete. And um, we're doing everything that we can as well. We're still um, assessing whether we're going to be able to test our, our student athletes as they come back on campus. We're certainly going to ask any of our student athletes who have been out of the country uh, to, to quarantine for two weeks, um, closing off our locker rooms and weight rooms and things of that nature. And coaches are being creative on, on how to condition and, and get our student athletes ready to play while ma maintaining social distance as best as they can. But it, you know, one thing I'll say too is our student athletes are students first, and uh, I'm so proud of the work that they did in the classroom last spring. They're some of our best and brightest students. We had so many student athletes end up on the Dean's list or the President's list or the all academic teams for Region 10 and the NJCAA. Just very proud of the work that they did, even though um, they were faced with online instruction when they weren't, weren't planning on it. And even when they were disappointed that they weren't able to uh, play baseball or play softball or whatever the case may be. So we look forward to hopefully making those opportunities available here in a couple of weeks. One of the, one of the dilemmas as we've talked about testing is an ethical one uh, in the sense of the NCA requirements to play have just unbelievable testing requirements that really are contradictory with the CDC. You're testing every week in season, every other week out of season, every student athlete. And you think about that at every NCA school, division one, two, and three. And what if your community doesn't have enough testing supplies? And is it is is it important to be testing student athletes that just so they can play as opposed to having those testing resources uh, for the community and the hospitals of people who are sick? So that's a, that's a tough balance. And I'm hoping as testing expands and there's more testing uh, technology available where that becomes easier, that makes it easier for us to monitor. But that's something that, you know, weighs on me each and every day. How do we balance those two? Thank you so much. One last question, and uh, then I want to share a little information. Uh, somebody's asking if you're practicing social distancing inside the facility, what if someone gets COVID in the classroom? Would that cause the entire class to be quarantined? Not, not unless there was a definite contact, close contact where social distancing had not been adhered to. Uh, we have emphasized this with all of our faculty that this is this is something that you can't just relax on. You can't be in a situation to where uh, you allow something to occur. Uh, if we're maintaining social distancing and we have the face covers and we're doing cleaning, it absolutely would not necessarily mean that a whole class would be quarantined. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That. I was just going to say that's the same advice we've gotten from our health directors. And uh, so that's what we're trying to do is make sure that we, again, have folks following the protocols. That's the reason it's so important. And if they'll just be understanding and compliant, then then hopefully this will, um, you know, we won't have as many of those issues. I would uh, almost, well, I won't say it that way. I would be shocked if someone gets COVID in a classroom given the social distancing would occur, the plexiglass, the students in a face covering, the faculty member have a face shirt, still see their expressions and they can communicate and they're wiping down every area with sanitizing wipe every single time. That'll be that'll be safer than being in your home or being 
or being in a grocery store. Uh, so I feel like our classrooms will be really safe. Any area on campus where, where has been uh, exposed to COVID, whether it's a classroom or a dorm room or a, or a lab, you know, has to sit for 24 hours as we understand it. Then we bring in and do what we would call a COVID clean. The Airmark can do. Surf Pro has been great with that. If we've had uh, campus facilities, they can come in and they do a fantastic job and, and can knock it out. So, so part of that, again, is following the health guidelines of letting it sit for 24 hours and then coming back and cleaning in that area. Thank you. One other question that came in that I think is important to address is, will there be testing available on campus? We have uh, <clears throat> Cornerstone Health and we contract out with the uh, uh, Catawba uh, Medical Center here. That's an outstanding hospital. The CEO happens to be one of our alums. And so we have the testing we've done so far, our, our um, uh, healthcare providers, our physician assistants have done the nasal swabs. We've actually, through their recommendation, have been contracting out with a private lab who uh, is able to overnight swabs, and we've been getting test results back in about 48 hours. Uh, so that's been a, a real good partnership. Uh, so yes, while we would do that, we would schedule it, but we're also scheduling folks through our health department, through the testing that's being provided around campus. We would not provide public testing on campus. We don't have the facilities to do that, but we would be arranging for our own students and, and, uh, to be tested here. We've, we are considering that and we've, we've been working with uh, Jennifer McCracken with the Top County Health Department. And I wanna echo Fred's uh, kudos to Jennifer. She's been amazing and we're gonna, we're going to be ready to do that if, if you know it's really needed here in our community. But uh, initially, we're just going to focus in on on how how the community is responding as we go through the first couple of months, and uh, then make decisions on that. But we're definitely prepared to do on-site testing, and we've we've uh, identified the the private companies and and are ready to pull that trigger if necessary to protect our community. And I did mention earlier, but uh, just to reiterate, we do have um, West Caldwell Health Council on our campus uh, in what's called our Cobra Care Clinic. So we will have testing available uh, as long as they have tests available for our students and our employees. Our, our health department has set up um, different locations in our county. So at this time, uh, I think they have our county covered, but certainly if that were to become an issue, um, you know, we. I always say community is the most important word in our name. And so we'll be here to support our community. Thank you so much. Well, we're gonna get ready to wrap up. I did wanna just mention to, um, again, to thank our, our co-sponsor, the Catawba, Valley, uh, Catawba County Chamber of Commerce. And we want you guys to know that, um, that our higher education uh, institutions are here. Um, our employers, we're here to come alongside of you and to help you with your needs, your training needs, please reach out to us. Um, you can contact us at K64 or Keith site in uh, CBCC's uh, Business and Industry Center. Um, and we encourage you to reach out. We continue to collaborate with the chamber and others in our community to focus on talent development, the workforce academies, apprenticeships and internship opportunities. And we're adapting those as we all face these challenges. Um, as well as customized training. So be sure to reach out to us and, and we, are, we want you to know that we're here to support those needs and to can you continue to help you with talent development. Uh, before we close out today, I want to welcome Bryce Melton. She's a uh, Dean at CVCC and she's gonna share a little bit about a new series we have coming up. And then Cindy Fulbright's gonna close us out for the day and tell us about next week's webinar. Thank you all for being with us today and thank you to our panelists. Good afternoon. CVCC is excited to announce in partnership with K64 a new series of our leader talks called Ed Talks. Uh, we're going to be focusing on future ready students, employees, uh, com and communities. Topics will include our community college associate degree programs, what are they and how they work, college transfer degree programs, and the comprehensive articulation agreement with our university partners and the independent colleges and universities. Our career and college program, promise programs and our uh, um, 
cooperative innovative high school programs for high school students and how those work. Um, and if you have interested high school students, um, what those uh, what those mean. So we hope you'll join us uh, for these future events. We hope that you've had a uh, an informative uh, session with us today. Our next leader talks will will be August the 11th. Our guests will be the leaders of Catawba County Schools, Newton Conover Schools, Hickory City Schools, and Alexander County Schools. We thank you for being here today, and we thank our honored guests, uh, Dr. Henshaw, Dr. Witt, and Dr. Porch. Have a good day, and thank you so much for attending.